In this second Thanksgiving episode, we dig into some emotional spaces as we unpack anti-Native racism that the holiday brings up. That for American Jews, it's an unexamined holiday that like adopting it was part of how they assimilated. Um, and so they have adopted yeah. it like full bore and, and it's completely yeah. unexamined. Um, and I'm, I'm including myself in that as well. Like I really have never done a whole lot of thinking about Thanksgiving in the, I, mean, well, I, I just a great read one person to do it with. Well, yeah. I mean, As that's someone who spent thinking. a lot of time on it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, so it feels like a, a useful thing. And also to, I just, I just edited the one, the white supremacy one where you sort of said like, I decide, and sometimes it's not for me. I'm not the right person. Cause it's too hard for me to have that conversation. So if that's the case with this, like, I, no, I want to honor that. It. No, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. Thank you. I appreciate that. This is Jews Talk Racial Justice with April and Tracy. A weekly show hosted by April Baskin and Tracy Guy Decker. In a complex world, change takes courage. Wholehearted relationships can keep us accountable. So Tracy, you proposed this morning that, um, you know, you said that it would be good for us to talk about Thanksgiving and that you're on your own journey that, you know, you've been really dedicating yourself to learning more about race and racism and racial justice and anti-racism, all, all the phrases, <laughs> and um, that in, in terms of Native American oppression, that's one piece that you have relatively less knowledge of. And so you were excited for us to possibly explore that subject as well as any other things relating to, to holiday. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I realizing that there is sort of a hole in my education um, regarding the origins of the holiday. Um, I think I I still mainly have the myth that I was taught as an elementary school kid, Um, but also just the structural and systemic nature of the oppression of the indigenous people of North America. I think I I have a a couple of moments in my head, you know, trail of tears maybe, and other moments Mm -hmm. that like they did teach me in school. but I, I don't, I haven't done the same kind of learning um, regarding, uh, regarding the oppression of, of Native Americans as I have done around the oppression of people of African heritage in this, this country. So yeah, it's definitely a hole for me that I'd like to address. And I'm guessing that maybe some of our listeners have similar, similar gaps in their education. So I'm looking up and out because there's this bird that you can probably hear and it feels in my mind like it's my ancestors in some way. I'm not sure what the message is, but I haven't had birds land on my window. And um, this bird is just chirping away. And I feel like it's my indigenous and African ancestors being like, oh, we have a lot to say about this subject. <laughs> Guess what? We have a whole bunch to say, right? And here's the thing, like, I kind of hate Thanksgiving. Like, I, and I, and I hate it because I love it. Like, I love part of it. Like, it's not like I'm apathetic. Like, it's like, I, it's not like I don't care. I, I, but I'm, it makes me angry with my home country in a lot of ways about a lot of things. You know, I I think before I could even talk about education or those pieces, like I just have to get it off my chest. I didn't want to win some folks Thanksgiving with this stuff because I don't think that I think at times actually I think that there actually is a real purpose for direct action but I wasn't looking to do a direct action and and mess up people's Thanksgiving with our podcast show so I tried my best to hold my tongue (laughs) what I would love I actually don't fully know but this is my best thinking that I can do this far. And I think that there's likely still emotional processing I need to do to think even more clearly about this, that there's just so much betrayal and anger I feel relating to the holiday. But like, it's like my basic stance is I love the idea of family time and being grateful for everything, but I don't want it intricately tied with the settler colonial narrative um, about a people that this country or a nation state 
tried to entirely annihilate over yeah. hundreds of years and continually broke treaties with like the story of natives in America after the arrival of, of settlers is just not exclusively, but it's mostly one promise made and promise broken and treaty signed and treaty broken one and, and just countless murder and, you know, putting um, diseases, smallpox and blankets and distributing them to native people and yeah. slaughter. And like at the risk of saying too much, um, it is the equivalent to me if I think the safest thing I can say, I think I'll say a safer thing that won't trigger other people's trauma as much, but like, is if we had a similar holiday around slavery, where it was like, the slaves were so happy and danced for us and loved doing this. And we're all going to eat food together. And for me personally, and you know, and I get into arguments with about this with a beloved family member, because they like they take the perspective of I want to bring in anti-racism into the holiday. And I'm just like, I want to completely do away with this holiday. Let's find a different date on the calendar, ideally in the fall, because Thanksgiving food is delicious, and recreate a different narrative. I mean, if you really like if, maybe even it's even just like switching the day or you know, like it needs to be some shift. So people's work schedules are planned out. And because of capitalism, like I need to, I need some kind of reset here where we just do away with that asinine lie of a story. Um, like, and it's not even just that it's in the past, like with, with the pipeline stuff, like yeah, with the Keystone um, pipeline, excuse me. The Keystone Pipeline. Exactly, with the Keystone. It was meant to go through native land. Yeah, well, yes, land. and like, and Mount Rushmore is in the area that is a, a native Sacred. burial ground. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Leonard Peltier, who I did my international baccalaureate high school paper, history extended paper on his wrongful incarceration. He is still wrongfully incarcerated for the suspected murder of an FBI agent, but the case was incredibly flimsy. Different witnesses have recanted. It was just totally bogus. Like it's happening now. Yeah. And so it just, I just get really upset about this stuff. Like, I think I need to take more time personally, honestly, to cry about it. Like it's, it's really upsetting to me and it's heartbreaking. And it is so, I'll stop in a moment. <laughs> Cause I don't, it's not like I put this on people who practice. Some folks do. I don't put it on like, I don't think some of my extended family who observe this, like, they're not like, oh, yay, <laughs> like native slaughter. It's sickening to me. Like, I, I love gratitude. Like all, I love food, all of those beautiful things. I want, I want my mother to be able to keep one of her favorite holidays for all of the reasons why she loves it because it's beautiful right? Um, and to me, some of the stuff is just not, there just needs to be a separation because it's sickening to me that that narrative is that, like, it's just too, what, why don't you talk now? I just, it really, it really is genuinely upsetting. Yeah, for me. I see that. I think just heartbreaking. Part of what I think maybe is so heartbreaking is that the lie of the story that goes with Thanksgiving at the core of it is the lie that the relationship between the white European settlers and the native people was consensual, that this was like a consensual coming together of, um, of equals that, that the native people who's the, the name of the people, actually, we, we never learn it. We just call them Indians. We don't, at least I never learned the name of the actual nation. Um, when I was a kid, I, um, just today read an article that named them. Um, anyway, the, the, the story that we've, that we are told is that it was, it was a gift that the native people came like consensually, uh, lovingly giving to, uh, to the white settlers. And that is just 
I mean, even without any real education around it, <laughs> um, just what I do know from, from what I did learn in middle school, I know that <laughs> it can't have been the case um, in the same way that I think I mentioned to you this morning that I sort of realized it's, it's very similar to the lie that we were told around, about, um, about Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson's um, slave, who I was taught was his mistress. I'm putting quotes around that word, but the word mistress mm -hmm. implies a consensual relationship. And she was his slave and she was 14 when their relationship started. There was nothing true. I, I just, there's nothing truly consensual about that, about that relationship. Um, yeah. She was a survivor of rape. Yeah. Um, and, and sex slavery. I mean, the, the power dynamic yeah, child, there is yeah, child sex slavery. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually her mother was too, cause her, her mother, um, was the child of an enslaved woman and Jefferson's father-in-law. So I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at is I'm, I'm inviting listeners to really hear the distress that April is feeling around this and think about like really sit with that and bear witness to it and think about too um, the stories that you told and really just scratch just a little bit and see that we weren't told the truth. We have not been told the truth about where this holiday came from and how it came to be and the people who were involved in the so-called first Thanksgiving. Right. And I think, you know, I think part of it, you know, if I want to be brave and go deeper because part of me as I'm talking with you I'm questioning like why is it so charged for me like I, I do this kind of work all the time it's something that I've been studying since I was a small child and I think that that's part of it is that there's still this like a certain amount of incompletion and disruption for me as someone with native heritage, like my, my family are members of a native American tribe. My grandfather, uh, my grandfather's mother was a uh, native. She was Cherokee with um, Chickasaw and Choctaw heritage from Chickasaw County, Mississippi. And I had to fight my entire childhood to find the scraps of identity to know that part of myself. Like in middle school, I did this um, for history day, this national history day competition. I spent a lot of time. I learned about the Mardi Gras Indians um, of New Orleans. They're a group of people who are like my family, who are like me, who are the descendants of formerly enslaved Africans and native Americans in the Southeast and they, every year they make these gorgeous ornate um, costumes and they bead like thousands of beads and they bead, um, you, like you can look it up and then they're stunning. I thought they were so beautiful. And I was like, they're like me. And I spent, I did an amazing project um, and I was disqualified because I only had one source, one, uh, what do you call it, primary source? Cause there was only one published book about them. Mm. <laughs> like I did all of this research and I made my own costume with like a star of David and the world. And I did, and I beaded these patches myself. Like it's like, so I think part of this also just is like intertwined with the profound sense of loss I have. And what keeps me going is as I get more into my mystical education and can find ways, but it's like, it's a fight um, to connect with people who know something. You know, I had, I made huge progress for a while when I dated this guy who ended up being not so great in a lot of ways, but he was a former um, chief of a tribe of, um, I almost said the tribe for specificity. And then I was like, that could identify him. So I'm not going to say anymore, but um. And, and through him, I learned all of these things that made my life make more sense and helped me understand the visions I have and helped me understand a lot of things. And so I, you know, I wonder if um, as I do more work to heal, that loss of like constantly reaching 
and not always have some having something to grab onto or specifically by white but not only white there was one black dude in college I still at times have wanted to confront this person he's actually really lovely but I was at a mixed heritage club and he's like girl you ain't Native American Indian like and and I in that moment I allowed him to silence me Mm -hmm. And I got what he meant and I felt that shame, but I shouldn't feel that shame. And just um, this, this show isn't about me, but I think for the purposes of like self-awareness and transparency, I think that that, that might explain some of the heightened emotion and lack of clarity I have is that I need to do more work around just mourning, like mourning what has been lost and what I feel missing in my own life in certain ways and it won't fix it, but it will help relieve, it will help like release that suffering that I think could make more room in my mind and my heart to navigate this issue with the level of skill and sophistication that I do with other issues. Whereas with this, it's just like, I just feel stuck between the people I love who love it and me just feeling like, I don't, I don't want anything to do with it. I want to, I I value the, the, the positive parts of the propaganda about things that I deeply believe in in practice. And, and I want there to be correction around this other stuff. Like, like this has got to get out of the textbooks. I'm sure I hope there's some, there's some group of smart people who are working to get this myth out of the textbooks. Um, You know, sitting with you. Thank you for listening. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you, t- you warned me that this would be hard for you. Um, and sitting with you as, you as this comes up, I'm really feeling the loss um, and the loss of the culture and the loss of sort of that connection to the ancestors. I actually, family lore is that I, on my non-Jewish side, actually have um, one Cherokee woman ancestor. So she was my gr- my father's mother's great grandmother. So it's pretty far back. And the only name that we have for her is Elizabeth, which I, I suspect though, I can't know for certain was the Christian name that she took when she, um, married the white man that was my ancestor. And I almost never think about this woman. Um, and, and hearing you think about your ancestors and trying to find, more about them and and being sort of stymied is really underscoring that loss of my knowledge of my ancestors as well and the culture of genocide right that that it is hard to find that like these there are millions or there like there were millions and millions and millions of them where are the records where are the narratives and like this is a part of um genocidal settler colonialism that either they were erased or they're hidden or they're incredibly hard to find, right? Well, I think that actually my ancestor Elizabeth um, is kind of speaking to that in my mind right now. And even the way that my family has sort of passed that down, it was like, it was a point of pride, but it was really just like a little like, did you know? And then we moved on because we had uh, the, the whiteness had completely, you know, absorbed her and she was just like a she's she's become just a footnote kind of thing in our family tree but but the whiteness has completely absorbed and erased any any Cherokee anything um and that's part of what white does it does that it's, to you well exactly culture. exactly that's I think that's really the profundity of that micro of my family tree to the macro of the way that whiteness and colonialism works is really kind of blowing my mind right now Right. Yeah. And I, you know, I think to sort of draw this to a close for the time being is some things that I'm holding in my mind that I think are important to name as a general liberatory practice. I often like to name my specific tribe. I'm not in this moment because I'm anticipating that maybe someday our show will be, be even more prolific. And I want to be thought at times I try to be thoughtful about privacy of different folks around visibility and things, but I, you know, I think it's really important to contradict the notion that Native Americans are no more, that, that their numbers are much smaller, but Native Americans are still very much here and live um, in U.S. society and are leading powerfully um, in all types of spaces around um, planetary sustainability, around women's rights, around public health. 
Um, and so, you know, the first place I would go to once I process more of my own internal disruption is checking back in with liberation leaders from the American Indian movement historically, as well as what our current modern day native leaders saying around what are excellent next steps and, and what needs to happen. Um, just like I look to black liberation leaders in, in terms of their thoughts and movement leaders and I consider myself a leader in my own right, but I am very much standing on the shoulders of many giants and following the lead and um, believe my leadership and it's important for my leadership to be in accountable relationship with those who have come before me. You know, if it's meaningful for others, I, I invite you to search or maybe if and when I do take the time to do this or you do Tracy, we can revisit this conversation. Um, you know, I don't know if I, I think because of what's live around it for me, I don't know if I exactly addressed your specific <laughs> well, I think prompt. There, I mean, there's still, I, I still have work to do um, educating myself more about the truth that's behind the myth that I've been given, but even j just being able to bear witness to the pain that, that's real and today, I think was an important important moment for me and for our listeners, um, because I, to your point that you just made, um, I think there is this sense that Native Americans kind of are no more, and that's obviously not true. That it's not an um, issue, that it's purely a thing of the past. Exactly, exactly. Um, and it's, it's clearly not true that that, that um, these people or their cultures are extinct. Um, the, the other thing I want to I'm going to do. I'm going to commit to you to do this, and I'm going to invite our listeners to do this as well as a first step to to start doing this. It's a, there's a mapping project that looks at where yeah. what different peoples um, inhabited the different lands, um, and I'm going to look up what peoples um, inhabited the space where I now live. Learning about them and honoring them regularly, and saying their name and bringing their name back to the space that is now Baltimore. Um, so, and I'll I'll put the mapping site in our show notes, and I want to invite our listeners to actually take the time in this sort of post Thanksgiving moment to start to undo some of the myths that we've um, that that we've consumed and internalized um, about our fellow citizens who whose families were actually indigenous to this to this land. Yeah. Thank you. That's perfect. That's something that is often done in movement spaces. And we haven't talked about that practice. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. And so I think some of our listeners will be very, very familiar with it. And some may have seen it and not fully understood the context and some may have not. So I'm, I really, one, I adore you in general. And so I'm really glad um, since I'm more in a tender space right now that you brought that up. It's really great. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. Our show's theme music was composed by Elliot Hammer. You can find this track and other beats on Instagram at Elliot Hammer. If this episode resonated with you, please share it and subscribe. To join the conversation, visit JewsTalkRacialJustice.com, where you can send us a question or suggestion, access our show notes, and learn more about our team. Take care until next time and stay humble and keep going.